to make sure you can all hear me. Yes. So what I'm going to do is talk to you today about a program that I've been involved with, with for the past four years. It's an international program. Its logo uh -huh. is up here on the top right screen. It's the International Nitrogen Management System. And this is a program that is designed to take what we know about nitrogen pollution, as well as the benefits we get from nitrogen, and try to develop a process by which we can inform policy, both at the national scale and the international scale, in order to reduce the negative impacts of too much nitrogen all over the global system. So I am not going to show you any nitrogen cycles. Um, you can get those out of textbooks today. But I will talk about how we're trying to use science as a foundation for, for setting policy. And, and along the way, I'll talk a little bit about how I got to where I am right now. But as Laszlo said, I am with the US Geological Survey, which is a research arm of the United States government. I'm also at Colorado State University. Um, I did my research and continue to in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and you'll see some slides there about that, looking, starting to look for acid rain, but then deciding that because we didn't have acid rain and discovering that we had a lot of nitrogen deposition for the past 30 some years, we have been looking at the effects of that nitrogen. But that actually is just a, an introduction to, to the science I'm gonna to present today, which moves well beyond Colorado. So I'm going to start with a couple of quotes and these are from Mark Sutton. I have a picture of him in, the, in a minute. These say, and, and this is important because this is why we are doing what we're doing. The United Nations Environment Program 2014 yearbook highlighted the importance of reactive nitrogen in the environment. Its conclusions are alarming. This is not just because of the magnitude and complexity of the problem, but because so little progress has been made reducing it. Mark goes on to say, few of the solutions identified have been scaled up while the world continues to pump out nitrogen pollution that contributes significantly to declines in air quality, deterioration of terrestrial and aquatic environments, exacerbation of climate change, and depletion of the ozone layer. So these are slides that, that are uh, show what's going on over time. These are global scale slides. You can see on the bottom axis that it goes from the year 1900 actually up to about 2016. Um, on the X axis, on the Y axis, this increases in nitrogen fixation over time. And what you can see is about mid 20th century, somewhere around 1950 or so, you see a huge increase. And if we start on the bottom of this diagram, the dark blue is biological nitrogen fixation in crops. This is soy and other legumes. I know that Brazil has a huge, um, pro produces a huge amount of the world's soy for, for mostly for, for livestock, but you can see that it has increased. So has nitrogen oxide emissions. These come from industrial and energy production as well as the transportation sector all worldwide. But the really large increase comes from production and application of nitrogen fertilizer, which is produced through an industrial process called the Haber-Bosch process. And there's a whole story about that I will not go into. But you can see that since 1960 or so, it has increased tremendously. Commensurate, the entire nitrogen emissions, commensurate with the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, which is the dotted line there. So we get a number of benefits out of all of this. Of course, 21st century society has seven point something billion people. And the primary reason for that is because fertilizer has transformed agriculture on this planet in such a way that we have extended lifespans, we've increased quality of life, human well-being. We've, we've been able to feed all those people and our population re reflects that. That doesn't mean that it's taken place all over the world. So this is a, a Mark Sutton shows up in all of these slides. Um, this is a book that was written for, for um, that you can access online called Our Nutrient World. And he looked at the major river basins of the world. 
or they did, this is a many authored document, and they estimated the net anthropogenic nitrogen inputs, mostly from agriculture. That's about 80% of the source of reactive nitrogen on the planet today. So major river basins, you can see um, the Mississippi River Basin in North America. You can see Western Europe, um, India and China. These are areas where so much nitrogen is put into the environment that an awful lot of it is, is unintentionally released into fresh waters, soils, natural vegetation, um, freshwater veg uh, ecosystems, and, and into coastal and estuarine systems. If you look in Brazil um, along the northwest co northeast coast there, you can also see lots of nitrogen in excess of what's actually being needed. So there are still some parts of the world where nitrogen is not limiting or is limiting to growth. Um, we, we like that when it occurs in, in, in the Amazon forest. We like that when it occurs in the northern hemisphere up in the boreal systems. But sub-Saharan Africa is still food insufficient. So they are not receiving, and there's a tremendous number of people there. So they're still not receiving as much nitrogen in order to optimize their agriculture as, as everyone else. For the rest of us, though, it's been both a, a positive benefit in, in terms of quality of life, as I've mentioned, but also negative in terms of the ecological effects and human health. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a story about how I got to this project. And these slides are mostly for Laszlo because we have worked together in mountains um, over, over a number of years. This slide is in the Rocky Mountains. It's in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a picture of Lock Vale Watershed. And this is a long-term instrumented ecological research and monitoring program that I started in 1983. What you're looking at there is, is 4,000 meters up at the top of these mountains down to 3,000 meters. So it's high elevation. You can see that it's got glaciers. It's um, largely unvegetated. And we started this project with three objectives. And these objectives are still valid today. The first question was, can we understand and differentiate natural processes from human caused drivers of change? Very little was known almost 40 years ago about how these ecosystems actually work. It was an exciting time to start a, an ecological project. Our second objective was to quantify the effects of atmospheric deposition, specifically atmospheric nitrogen deposition and climate variability and climate change on high elevation ecosystems. And our third objective, which is really still very important, is to share this knowledge with managers and policymakers who protect these natural resources. So science should be the foundation by which all public lands, um, any, any lands are managed and we have made it a large goal of ours to make sure that we provide this information so that it can be put to use. So here is the punchline of mere, nearly 40 years of research. Everywhere in these ecosystems, we found nitrogen caused changes. Nitrogen was fertilizing these ultra oligotrophic ecosystems. We found changes in alpine vegetation, uh, looking at what we found and, and working with my colleague Bill Bowman and Mark Fenn, we found that there was an increase in grasses and sedges and a large decrease in flowering plants and forbs because the grasses and sedges were opportunistically taking up the nitrogen during the very short growing season. We also found large changes in forest biogeochemistry. We were able to see changes in, in tree growth rates, in foliar carbon to nitrogen ratios, um, and, and, and slowly changing, well, I cannot say we're changing species composition. Other things, including climate change, are doing that right now. We found large changes in our soil ecosystems. We found changes in CO2 flux. We found changes in microbial um, communities, nematode communities, and in soil food webs over time. We've also seen large changes in soil carbon cycling. We found large changes in lake and stream chemistry. Lakes that got more nitrogen deposition had much higher nitrate concentrations. And we did a, we had continued to do a number of experiments to look at what that means for the food webs. We've seen dramatic changes in lake algal assemblages and productivity. 
We're now dominated by green algae, but that's a recent phenomenon due to both nitrogen and climate change. Before that, we saw dramatic shifts in our diatom assemblages in lakes like this. So all of this work combined to build a body of evidence over many, many years that has now been put to use by the state of Colorado, by the National Environmental Protection Agency, and by the Park Service, National Park Service. And what they have developed is a program to reduce nitrogen emissions in order to restore these systems back to a critical load that we established over time. The critical load in biogeochemistry is a value below which there are no observed changes. What we see now is a value well above that. So can we reduce nitrogen emissions that then reduce deposition to put us back to the critical load? That's what we're trying to do. In, in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is protected in order to manage natural ecosystems in their purest state, if we can get us back to the critical load, it will not only benefit the national parks, but it will also benefit everybody else because by reducing emissions, you also then reduce uh, the impacts on human health, the impacts on visibility, the impacts on water quality. So there are many benefits to acting in order to protect this national park. So because I was successful at, at, at doing something that, that was able to do to, to help at least move us along toward protecting the area that I love so much, I decided it might be helpful to move on and help other work groups um, to, to do the same thing on a larger scale. So when I was offered the opportunity to join the International Nitrogen Management System, I said yes. So Mark Sutton, who is down here, is with the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Edinburgh. He's the person who has gotten this project funded. It's a four-year program funded by the United Nations Environment Program and the Global Environmental Foundation. It's its purpose is to bring scientific evidence together to inform policies and the public on the multiple benefits and threats of reactive nitrogen. So this is very important. It's bringing the science as a foundation in order to manage and improve our policy for nitrogen management. So we are now into our entering our fourth year of this large program, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of this this presentation. I promise you this is the only structural diagram you'll see. You'll see many more diagrams. But IM, INMS is built under four components. Excuse me. The first one, which is the one I will talk about, is developing the science. It's the tools and methods for understanding the nitrogen cycle. There are three other components. One is global and regional quantification, of nitrogen use, flows, impacts, and benefits of practices. That's being largely done by, by models and modelers in the European Union who have been giving us not only um, estimates of what's going on around the world, but also scenarios by which we could conceive of reducing nitrogen under different types of, of climate change scenarios, as well as management. The regional demonstrations, which are component three, there are some on every continent, and there's a very active and successful one here in Latin America. It's headed up by Jean Ometo and Philippe Pacheco, um, in, and it centers around La Plata Basin. So it's um, been a, a model for many of the rest of us as we develop our own regional demonstrations. And then the final component is awareness raising, knowledge sharing, and we do this through uh, meetings. Mark Sutton does this way more than the rest of us meetings with nations, meetings with the United Nations in order to get understand, to raise understanding of the effects of nitrogen worldwide. So I will talk more about component one and my portion of it, which is developing a guidance document for nitrogen impact assessment for human health, as well as environmental threats and benefits. So we, and I will work my way through this these bullets as we work through the rest of the talk. We're developing a conceptual, well, we have adopted a conceptual framework of nit reactive nitrogen impacts assessment. When I talk about reactive nitrogen, which is NR, that's all of the species of nitrogen on the planet except N2 gas. 
N2 gas makes up 78% of our atmosphere, but it's inert. You're breathing it all the time, but it is unable to be used for plant growth. And as you all know, nitrogen is essential for, for a growth of any living thing on earth. It is the stuff of DNA. It is the stuff of proteins. So without it, growth slows down. So we're develop, We're going to present a conceptual framework. We're going to identify key indicators to assess the impacts. We're using this framework to look specifically between pressures, states, and impacts, and I'll go into that more. And then I'll give you some examples for individual and integrated assessment of reactive nitrogen impacts. This is the framework that we're using. It's called DIPSER. DIPSER stands for drivers, pressures, states, impacts, and then responses, which are down on the bottom of this diagram. And this is a, a framework that's been adopted by the European Union and is, in, is gaining increasing acceptance around the world as a way for looking at environmental effects, any kind of environmental effects. In our case, we're trying to put it to use for nitrogen. We will see how successful we are. So the ultimate drivers for nitrogen is the demand all over the planet for energy, food, and goods. That's the ultimate demand. Those drivers, though, create all kinds of nitrogen species, and I'll go into that. I won't go into that in tremendous detail. Those species create pressures on states, or as an ecosystem ecologist, I would call these pools of, of where the nitrogen lands. There's the air or atmosphere. There's land, the terrestrial ecosystems. There's water, and by water, I mean freshwater, groundwater, coastal and marine ecosystems. And then there are man-made materials that nitrogen produces. Um, this is an undervalued use of, of reactive nitrogen that provides tremendous amounts of, of products that we use every day, fabrics, pharmaceuticals, um, pesticides and herbicides. These states are then altered and as they are altered, they have impacts. We've created seven categories of impacts. Um, one is greenhouse gases. Nitrogen, of course, can be a, a greenhouse gas. It can also affect the stratospheric ozone layer. Um, nitrogen, um, human health is a major impact here, especially respiratory diseases, but there are others too. Terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems are directly affected by nitrogen, as we have been talking about already. Agricultural and non-agricultural products are the benefits that we put all this nitrogen to use for. And then there are cultural services that are impacted. And these can range from um, degradation, corrosion of buildings and materials to a reduction in human well-being when you have uh, skin irritants from, from cyanobacteria. It can also affect haze. So if people are are being tourists and they go to see a certain vista and they can't, that's a cultural service. There are economic impacts too of nitrogen, excess reactive nitrogen. So you will see this slide again. This is the framework by which we are working our way through impacts to policy. I wanna start first by looking at pressures to states. And if we drill down from our major sources, major sources being demand for energy, food and goods, those are produced by combustion of fossil fuels, by crop biological nitrogen fixation, again, that's the soy and legumes that we grow, and by the Haber-Bosch process to industrially produce nitrogen. So Haber-Bosch is a process that was developed um, in, the, in Germany many years ago. It takes atmospheric nitrogen, which as I mentioned is inert, and it makes it reactive. It produces ammonia over time. So these, it exert pressures as the various nitrogen species move into the different states. We have developed in integrated indicators for state, in state changes. We also have specific indicators for state changes that are described in our guidance document. I'm not going to go in there today, but I wanted to give you an idea of how we're looking in, at a integrated way at, at how nitrogen is affecting ecosystem states. There's the planetary boundary approach, and you may have seen this paper, several papers that have come out over the past several years that say there are a number of anthropogenic forces that are changing the global environment. Only two or three of those are actually beyond the state of exceeding boundaries by which 
um, life on Earth can be optimized or or made as as in, as well as well being as possible. Two of those are nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. The other is loss of biodiversity. Climate change is actually not yet exceeding a planetary boundary, but it's close. So we take that approach in our document. We, um, I'll describe the exceedance of critical loads because that's directly pertinent to terrestrial and, and aquatic ecosystems. Other integrated indicators you may have heard of are input output budgets or mass balances. These are very good ways of keeping track of how much is going where it should versus how much is unintentionally being released to the environment. Nitrogen use efficiency has also gained a lot of popularity. It's a way of looking at how agriculture primarily is using the nitrogen that is applied to it in order to grow the crops that we use. And nitrogen footprint is, a, is an interesting approach where you can go from a personal level to calculate your own up to a country level to look at how humans specifically are taking nitrogen in for their purposes and how much of it is leaching out unintentionally. I make, let me give you some examples for, it, for critical loads because these are ecological and they're close to what we try to do. The United States, um, thanks to Christopher Clark, whose paper this is and, and his life work, has been developing critical loads on a national scale in order to set policy. Now, I developed a critical load for Colorado many years ago, and it was specific actually for one lake because that's all I had confidence in. And to our surprise, because of the body of evidence, it was useful for policy, but that really won't work. You must scale up. So in scaling, you actually lose a lot of detail, but it might be valuable in order to set policy, as I've said before. So the way this is calculated is that first of all, Long, many, many studies and many experiments and publications were brought together to decide which types of vegetation, this is terrestrial vegetation, which types of vegetation would respond to nitrogen at what levels of nitrogen deposition per hectare per year. So Chris presents these values in moles of nitrogen per hectare per year. I have to translate those, so that's about three. If you look at the light green on this figure of, of the conterminous United States, that has a critical load established by them of about three to five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Please keep that number in, in mind, three to five. And so this light green encompasses most of the Western United States, all the, much of the agricultural belt of the United States. Um, there are higher critical loads in the agricultural regions of California, and in the boreal regions of the northern part of the United States. So you take that number, three to five, that's the amount of nitrogen that would have to fall on these systems in order to change them, and then you overlay it with nitrogen deposition. So this is atmospheric dry and wet deposition for the period 20, 2001 to 2010 for the United States. We have a national atmospheric deposition program network that has 250 sites that collect nitrogen every week. We actually have one of those sites in my research area. And where Laszlo used to work up on Niwot Ridge, there's two of those sites. The highest site, the highest deposition occurs where the, the browns are the darkest. The lowest sites where for deposition are where the greens are the lightest. So you can see high deposition in the agricultural region of the United States, the, um, the Midwest, you see the values get lower and lower as you move toward the mountains where there's less agriculture, actually. In, in the case of Colorado, which is the square, can you see my cursor? This is the square, that's Colorado. That's where I am right now. Um, the values that are affecting my ecosystems in Rocky Mountain National Park are somewhere on the order of one and a half to 2.8 kilograms per hectare per year. So if you go back to what the critical load was established to be, three to five, and then you look at ours, you would say, no, we are not necessarily in exceedance for terrestrial nitrogen effects. Um, I'm here to tell you that's not true. We are in exceedance, but that's because we have high elevation, higher deposition. But for most of the country, this works pretty well. And it suggests that you could set different standards depending on your region for how you would like to 
interpret the nitrogen deposition effects and what that does to the critical load. Those get overlaid and that actually develops a map which is called exceedance. Where in the United States, where there's data, the white part is no data, where in the United States where there is enough information is too much nitrogen coming in that exceeds the natural vegetation critical load. And what would that do? We know what that will do. It will change species composition. It will lower biodiversity. I'll get there next. But if you were to look at this red region in the center of the country, this is tall grass prairie. There's very little natural tall grass prairie left, but the exceedance is on the order of five to 14 kilograms per hectare per year. In other words, nitrogen deposition would have to be reduced quite a lot if these ecosystems were to be restored to some kind of natural nitrogen regime. So this is how nitrogen exceedance is being calculated for terrestrial ecosystems in the United States. Here's another example from Canada, and this is the province of Ontario, which is in southeastern Canada, where most of the people live. Ontario is very large. I'm only showing you the forested part. This is from a paper by Julian Ahern. Um, the green area over here on the left is forested ecosystems and the dark, darker green values are more than 75% forested. Here is total nitrogen deposition, again, measured by a Canadian network. Nitrogen deposition in these darkest blue areas are more than 18 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And if you then take those two maps and you overlay them, Total nitrogen over here is on the bottom axis. The critical load determined by experiments and studies is 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. This is Eastern deciduous forest by and large. Over here is the cumulative distribution of forested area. And as you go from um, small amounts of forest to, to uh, the cumulative distribution, it suggests that more that about 40% of the forests in Ontario have been have had exceedance of their critical load. Again, it would take a lot of effort to reduce the atmospheric deposition to restore these ecosystems, but at least they know that they're being exceeded and they have a goal that they can work toward. That's an example of the integrated indicators that we're using. <coughs> Excuse me, let me move now from states to impacts. And as we're going to do that, as I described before, the states we've identified or arbitrarily classified are air, atmosphere, land, terrestrial ecosystems, water is freshwater and marine ecosystems, and materials. The impacts here, as I said before, are greenhouse gases, human health, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, agricultural products, non-agricultural products, and cultural services. Some of the impact indicators are over here on the right, and they go in order of these boxes of impacts. So CO2 equivalent warming, nitrous oxide, N2O, is a very strong greenhouse gas, um, orders of magnitude stronger than, a, than an equivalent molecule of carbon dioxide. Human health, incidence of respiratory disease. There are, are millions of, un, um, of, of premature deaths each year all over the planet because of smog and particulate matter. And, and these are direct products coming out of nitrogen, excess reactive nitrogen. You look at ecosystems, you look at um, terrestrial ecosystems, biodiversity is one that we are concerned with tremendously because nitrogen is one of the top drivers of the loss of biodiversity worldwide. Agricultural products, crop yield, of course, is used as an impact indicator. Um, it's been going up and up over time, which is a good thing. Fish mortality and changes in aquatic food webs are examples of the kinds of indicators we use for aquatic systems, corrosion of monuments for cultural services, and industrial fibers and pharmaceuticals. Those are examples of the kinds of things that we do. But the nitrogen doesn't always make a direct path from air to greenhouse gas or land to terrestrial ecosystems. Sometimes it does. But by and large, there are complicated sort of indirect pathways. And we've tried very hard to, to take note of those and try to quantify them. So here's a very scary diagram. I apologize, I made it. Um, this is describing some of the pathways to nitrogen impacts. That's what it says in the center. And over here, we've tried to describe these pathways 
Um, for instance, here's inorganic and organic nitrogen that moves into water. As it does so, it causes freshwater and coastal pollution, which has a human health and fisheries response. It can cause groundwater pollution, which leaves a legacy of high nitrogen, which will affect the, the output of nitrogen into coastal systems for hundreds of years as that nitrogen slowly moves through the groundwater and out into estuaries and coastal systems. If you move up here, um, nitrogen gets up into the atmosphere as nitrogen oxides and ammonia. It transforms in the atmosphere and is transported sometimes hundreds of kilometers away. As it does so, it contributes to particulate formation, acid rain, atmospheric ammonia, nitrogen deposition, forest growth, which is a plus, carbon sequestration, which is a plus. All of these, um, these impacts are affected. All of these, uh, these sectors of impacts are affected. Greenhouse gases, human health, um, freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems, agriculture, monuments and, and cultural values, and so on. You can work your way through each of these and follow these pathways. But like I said, some pathways are direct and others are not. So few are direct. Here's an example of one that is. Nitrous oxide, which is produced from soils um, through a microbial um, anaerobic process, creates this greenhouse gas, as I mentioned before. That greenhouse gas goes directly to warm the atmosphere and it is doing so and it is increasing in concentration. But nitrous oxide can also go up into the stratosphere where it is now the dominant molecule that is causing ozone depletion thanks to the Montreal Protocols a number of years ago. The Montreal Protocols severely reduced the production, in fact, canceled the production of chlorofluorocarbons that by the, at that time were the dominant ozone depleting substances. But that, that goes through a, a rather convoluted pathway. Less ozone allows increased UV light penetration to the Earth's surface. That can lead to human skin cancers, cataracts, and tremendous amount of ecological and agricultural impacts as, as um, UV damages tissues everywhere it goes. Here's one that's closer to home and a little scarier, I am sorry. Um, nitrogen oxides and ammonia get up into the atmosphere. They cause acid rain. Nitrogen oxide is a strong, or nitrate is a strong acid anion. As it falls into terrestrial ecosystems, it can cause soil acidification. One way it does that is by um, nitrate has to maintain charge balance as it flows through soils and into surface waters. As it does that, because it has to maintain charge balance, it takes with it cations from the soils. While there are base cations, basically calcium and magnesium, it will take those preferentially. But as it strips those soils of their base cations, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, because there has to be a maintenance of charge balance, it then goes to the acid anions, basically, <coughs> excuse me, hydrogen and aluminum. When you alter the base cation to aluminum ratio, your soils acidify, aluminum becomes soluble in acid soils. You can have a, a negative effect on forest growth, forest biomass declines, forest um, fungal and, and, and microbial food web in the soils change. All these anions then leach to waters. So you can have, first of all, a, a little increase in buffering capacity as your base cations move out of soils. Then you start to see a decrease in soil pH and you see aluminum and hydrogen increasing in your surface waters. This leads to lake and stream acidification causing fish kills. So you can go down any one of these paths through the direct and indirect pathways the only other one I will take you through here is atmospheric nitrogen deposition. Stimulates plants where, it's, where you have oligotrophic ecosystems. This is true in many tropical soils. It's also true in, in the mountain systems that have been historically very low nutrient systems. So the first thing you do is you stimulate these plants, but some plants grow better than others. And eventually they lead to a loss of biodiversity. And the same goes true for fresh waters. So we have made diagrams of it like this for every one of our impacts to show the direct and indirect impacts. And I'm not gonna go any more into down these pathways so much as to tell you how we are using these types of things. We've developed a matrix and this matrix is trying to make it easy for policymakers or anyone 
to go in and look at the impact. So let's say you're looking for an impact description. Here you will see it. Fish, I'm here are freshwater ecosystem examples, and I'll give you some terrestrial. So impacts are fish yields, freshwater eutrophication, that would be nitrate concentrations, um, but it's actually not the, well, it is, it's the impact. Freshwater eutrophication, these are different pathways they go through. What we identified is the pressure to state pathway. In all of these examples, it's nitrate leaching. So nitrate coming out either in from soils, from direct atmospheric deposition, or from groundwater into ecosystems. The state indicators are can be changes in nitrate concentrations in surface water, but also a state indicator, indicator can be an increase or a change in algal biomass. So if we continue off of this first line going across, the impact indicator that we're looking at right now is fish catch. Um, fish being, you know, fish is, it's not only a recreational source, but fisheries are a major source of protein for many people all over the world. Fish catch is incredibly important, both for subsistence and also for economics. The pluses and minuses tell you whether fish catch um, changes from nitrogen are impacted both positively or negatively. And in this case, it's both. So here's a function, and I'm going to come back to these functions in many times, many times for the rest of this talk. But according to the literature, what you're not seeing over here is one more column with all of the literature that we've assembled to, to justify how we're presenting this. If you have a very oligotrophic system to begin with, nutrient poor, you actually stimulate algae, which stimulates fish growth. And you can have an optimum value right here where there's just the right amount of nitrogen for the, right, for the best fish catch. But as you add more nitrogen, these indirect impacts take over. You see an increase in algal biomass. You see a, an increase in decomposition and a loss of, of oxygen values in your waters. Fish catch declines. Finally, we describe the spatial and temporal scales of impacts over here. We say that fish catch is local to regional in scope. It's not global. And the effects can occur over seasons because you could be reset each year if your nitrogen is not high, or, and, or it can extend to years and possibly, well, probably not longer. So we can go down each one of these. I won't because that will drive you all crazy. But what I want you to focus on is the idea of the shapes of these functions because we will come back to that. Let me take another example over here um, let me look here at, at the bottom one, which is actually interesting because it's indirect. The impact is the recreational use or the property values of people who live in areas with water and shorelines. So freshwater eutrophication um, is caused by nitrogen leaching. Nitrate in your waters can reduce oxygen in the waters. It can also change your aquatic, your algal assemblages. Very often you get increases in, in cyanobacteria, which can prov provide harmful algal blooms and cyanotoxins, which are skin irritants. They're also damaging to food webs. You have an increase in food in algal biomass. And again, this has a negative effect. This is recreational use, property values go down. But the function is a direct linear response. As soon as you start getting um, unsightly algal blobs all over the shoreline. As soon as fish start dying, you, this is a direct effect. It doesn't follow any other pathway. It's a linear response. Again, the scale is local to regional, seasons to years. Here's an example of the states, um, but not the impacts themselves from Europe. Over here on the left, we have the potential risk for nitrogen eutrophication. And these figures came from the European Nitrogen Assessment it was developed about almost 10 years ago now, but it's been used for guidance for how to reduce nitrogen over time. And what they did is again, they took a very broad brush like we did for North America. For freshwaters, they said, the potential risk for eutrophication is low in areas where there is not a lot of nitrogen deposition or agriculture, and that's the Scandinavian countries. It's medium up here in Germany, or I think this is Germany, um, and, and Poland along the Baltic Sea, which is around here, it's medium here, it's high throughout most of the rest of Europe. 
And this is because Europe is heavily populated. It's a very industri it's very industrial and agricultural agriculturally productive region of the world. The potential for eutrophication of all fresh waters, rivers and lakes is very high. They then applied this to lakes using long-term study lakes that they have in the European Union. And they looked at the ecological status of these lakes. The color scheme is sort of similar. Ecological class, in other words, these lakes are, utro are, are oligotrophic to mesotrophic and not impacted by nitrogen are blue. Again, the, many of them are found up here in, um, in Scandinavia. You get something more mixed as you move into the Baltic states in Finland, mixed again as you move around the Baltic Sea, which is heavily eutrophied, by the way, from nitrogen. The highest nitrogen occurs in your very high agricultural regions here, the Netherlands, Spain, France, um, United Kingdom over here. They did not take this into the final step of looking at the actual impacts but this is an important step of looking at where the state indicators have changed over time. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of terrestrial ecosystem changes here, um, but I won't again, describe all of them over time. Let's start up here. Again, it's the same kind of thing. Here's the impact description, the pathway from pressures to state, the state indicators that are changed, the impact indicator you would look for and the state impact functions in temporal and spatial scales. So plant biodiversity is a critically important, especially, um, well, for, for all reasons all over the world, but we are ecologists, so we take this very seriously. If you're looking at nitrogen deposition across the world, the indicator is soil nitrogen status. So percent soil N or percent soil N to C ratios. The impact indicator is biodiversity in almost all cases, biodiversity declines when you add nitrogen, but not all. So going back to the example I gave you for fish catch, we actually see that same pattern in terrestrial ecosystems that are very nutrient poor to begin with. Our ecosystems in, in high elevation mountainous areas are like that, where you add nitrogen, you stimulate growth because it had been so limiting before you get to a point where some new species can actually come in or you have a, a, a dominant amount of, of, of growth and you have the maximum amount of biodiversity. But as nitrogen, my cursor is not working, as nitrogen continues to increase, some plants dominate because they're able to take up nitrogen better and faster than others. And other species declined either because they're shaded out or because they are limited by some other nutrient or process, such as phosphorus or potassium, temperature or moisture. This can take place over a local or regional scale, and we certainly are seeing that. It takes place over years to centuries because plants don't necessarily grow all that fast. There are many ecosystems all over the world that did not start, however, pre-European settlement or, or well, pre-European settlement, they did not start um, from a state of ultra oligotrophic conditions. Grasslands all over the world are like that. So this other figure is, is an example of those where biodiversity was actually the highest in their undisturbed state. And as you add nitrogen over time, again, other plants take over, they, they um, disrupt the evenness and the distribution of species, they come to dominate and you get a, a decline in diversity to a low point where some one or two species dominate and biodiversity goes down. I'm gonna give you an example here and one more from the next slide. This is going um, to, again, nitrogen deposition, but the impact is mortality, toxicity, reduced plant growth rates, um, especially of trees. And this is related to soil nitrogen causing acidification like I showed you before. You change the calcium to aluminum ratio, you lower your soil pH. This leads to leaf and root damage and biomass, biodiversity decline. But the way it happens is basically a physical chemical reaction. So this is not biological necessarily, but the impacts are biological. Soils are buffered by base cations, as I mentioned before. When you deplete those, you actually can have an abrupt change in soil pH so that they then become buffered by acid cations, such as aluminum and hydrogen. So you can have sort of protection of these systems or you can, you can miss the change that's going on as you're adding nitrogen 
until you to reach a threshold and then you see an abrupt change and things happen. So this is important because I think I, we might be able to use this in terms of a policy setting. Um, and again, I'll come back to that because these functions are where we are trying to think now how they can be put best to use. I wanna give you one more example here and it's the bottom line in this impact matrix. This is biodiversity. The impact description is biodiversity protection, which is a good thing, right? And, and the pressure to state pathway is through agricultural intensification. And there are a number of papers that have come out recently. In fact, one as recently as a month ago that says, if you increase your agricultural production by adding more nitrogen and more nitrogen, more water and phosphorus to existing agricultural lands, you increase productivity on lands that are already in production. And that allows you to not have to clear more forest, more cropland, more new land for clearing. So they say you could protect natural ecosystems through agricultural intensification. You know, it's a great idea. Um, the idea would be that you would increase the agriculture, you would reduce the agricultural land and increase the area of protected lands by intensification. The problem is there is no relationship. Unless agricultural intensification comes with um, ironclad policies that say we will protect a comparable amount of land or some amount of land at the same time, there is no guarantee that intensification would actually lead to protection of, of, of natural areas and a protection of biodiversity. So in the United States, we call this a red herring. It's potentially very dangerous because it's attractive to policymakers, but there is no guarantee that by intensifying agriculture, you would indeed lead to biodiversity protection. So that's important too, as we discuss how we use these for policies. So we have developed, I've only shown you a few examples of all of these impacts that we go through. We've developed, my colleague Hideaki Shabata has developed a searchable database called NMIP, the Nitrogen Matrix of Impacts and Pressures. And you can go all the way through what I've just described to you for any one of these, all the way down to economic and model output, as well as find the literature in there. So I want to talk a little bit, finishing up this talk with the responses, with the responses in our Dipser diagram. Drivers we talked about, pressures to states, states to impacts. Here are the responses going back. And this is a question I would love to have discussion on as we finish. And the question is, can these response functions be useful for policy? Um, one side of me says it's too late. You either know there's a, an, a negative impact or there's not. On the other, there might be a value here. So we've been trying to categorize them into these different types of functions. There's linear functions where there is absolutely no minimum threshold by which nitrogen cannot cause an effect. So no critical load, for instance. An example of this is ozone effects on plant growth. Ozone is damaging, it, goes, it gets in through the stomata, it, it um, reduces the amount of oxygen cycling and, and photosynthetic capacity. No threshold at all. Here's an asymptotic, as, yeah, asymptotic sets of, of functions over here. This is where you have other limiting factors. So if you have nitrogen and it increases algal productivity, it can only go up to a certain point when it becomes limited by phosphorus or some other, maybe a trace metal coming in. The quadratic function I've described before, it gave you several examples of oligotrophic to an optimal level to eutrophic, that's an example. Um, here's a threshold value, exceedance of buffering capacity is what I've talked about before in soils leading to an abrupt change. And then my red herring over here. I think we need to be careful of these because they can lead to misinformed policy if, if it's um, a false correlation. So keep in mind, can these response functions be useful? And what we're trying to do now, and I don't have the answer, is we're trying to see whether we can use them in order to add to the scientific foundation we already have for policy and management. So here's phrasing the question again, um, can knowing the shape of a function and how close a value is to crossing an existing threshold or standard or criteria, can that help us determine the urgency 
and the types of action. We don't have an answer for that yet, but I think it's a topic I would love to have discussion on. So I need to acknowledge my absolutely wonderful collaborators in this effort, Hideaki Shibata, who by the way, is head of the International Long-Term Ecological Research Program, Asuza Oita at the Institute for Agro-Environmental Sciences in Tsukuba, Allison Leach, the University of New Hampshire, Timothy Weinman, who works with me, Daniel Lipson with the Soil Health Institute, Jana Compton with the Environmental Protection Agency, and Hans van Grinsven from the Netherlands. So I wanna thank you very much. I hope that we can have discussions and questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you. Um, thank you very much, Jill. Uh, can, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was a breathtaking uh, <laughs> walk, walk around the, the DPSIR system, how it's being applied to, to trying to figure out what we can do with nitrogen, how we can manage nitrogen. Um, I'll have a quick check if um, one of our potential uh, guests, no, unfortunately, she is not here. I invited uh, uh, a, a professor to join us um, for us for this uh, um, discussion that uh, you're uh, stimulating. Now, it's it's a it's a very uh, important issue issue nitrogen. I think that. Uh, in our part of the world, this question has not been so much focused because if we look at the uh, uh, thing back, uh, looking at the map that you have shown uh, nitrogen deposition um, in, uh, in South America, apart from the mega cities and surrounding areas and the agricultural areas, not has been uh, a major issue. Remembering that you're showing your um, uh, river basins, great river basins, uh, Amazon uh, outstandingly remained green without uh, showing any impact. I, I don't know how the annual burns actually, if we quantify the deposition from that, how that would uh, change the, the, the picture. Some of it we know that actually ends up in the Andes. Okay, so uh, we are receiving uh, questions principally about management, not yet about uh, management for conservation. Uh, the, the first question came in uh, when you were talking about the question of um, agricultural land and looking at Africa, talking about sub-Saharan Africa, where the actual uh, nitrogen, apparently there is a nitrogen shortage which cannot supply sufficient amount uh, for uh, for agriculture. I, I assume that there is an, an issue of water there as well. But the question that comes from Jennifer is, is the following. Um, okay, we know two things. A, we need to produce more food in that part of the world. Second, if we produce more food and intensify agriculture, we are going to be uh, causing damage to the, to the environment. So there is no win-win situation. Um, what is Not necessarily, the... but go okay. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. No, I, I know that you in the States, you always uh, say there is a win-win. So go ahead, please. What's well, the win-win situation? She, she is absolutely correct. We will never get to net zero with respect to nitrogen like we're hoping to get to with net carbon increase um, because we still have to produce food. And honestly, the best that we think we can get to um, this is not my work, but this is the work of Jim Galloway, is about 25% reduction currently. But that would go a long way, especially in some ecosystems where that would push us back toward agricultural protection, agricultural lands, protection that's still optimizing food production. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there's actually a huge opportunity to try to do it better than, than we have done certainly in, in the Northern Hemisphere, because ag nitrogen um, is still not distributed sufficiently. But if we could, we could put in place um, water treatment plants, um, trying to apply only the right amount of nitrogen in order to optimize growth. We can use better, better crop yields or better crop types that, that are increasingly becoming um, more, more efficient at, at taking up nitrogen instead of allowing it to leach. There's all kinds of new fertilizers that, that can be applied. The country of India 
very interestingly, um, mandated that all fertilizers in the country be coated with neem. And I forget what N-E-E-E -E -E stands for, but it's a, what it creates is a slow release type of nitrogen. And now the entire country of India requires that type of fertilizer to be applied so that it, the nitrogen leaches, the nitrogen dissolves slowly to be available to the plants instead of being put on all at once and made available to either volatilize to the atmosphere or leach down into the surface and groundwaters. So she's right, there's probably no way we can reduce nitrogen pollution even in sub-Saharan Africa, but we could try to do it better. And, and we have wonderful African colleagues who are beginning to try to work with us that way. Excellent. Now, uh, talking about agriculture, there's another question which um, uh, shows perhaps the interest in going back to, let's say, organic production. And the question is, uh, uh, what about the use of organic residues uh, and uh, animal dung, etc., for for fertilizing, avoiding the by well, cutting out the the the, the production partially cut, cutting out the production of synthetic fertilizers and that way somehow reducing uh, the the nitrogen released into the atmosphere and therefore uh, its return as atmospheric deposition. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as the world becomes more affluent, um, many, many populations who, who did not eat very much meat before are increasing their meat dietary consumption um, that doesn't necessarily, well, it does apply, certainly in North America. In South America, I think there was always a large protein, animal protein part of the diet. But, but what we're creating is a tremendous amount of manure. And there is manure growing all over the world. And, and in the developing, in the Northern Hemisphere developed countries like the United States, because synthetic fertilizer is inexpensive, Farmers are putting manure on and adding synthetic fertilizer on top. It's not uncommon to have people adding 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare to their cropland, which is so far in excess of what the plants need because they're spreading their manure. They need to get rid of it. And then they go, well, it's cheap insurance. I'll add a little more nitrogen. It doesn't hurt the farmers or the crop yield to add too much nitrogen. It's the, the leaching and the volatilization that hurt the environment downstream, but they're not required to pay for it. So I have a colleague from Canada, his name is Shabtai Bittman, and he has been working with a group of people in the United States to develop what's called manure sheds. So you think of an air shed or a water shed, this is a manure shed because manure by definition is wet and heavy. So you can't really transport it around the world and either in in order to put it where it's needed most. And what they are trying to do now is develop a, an educational program of where you could, within a certain number of kilometers of, an agri of, a, of a feedlot or a cattle production activity, where could you take that manure and it, where could you then educate the farmers who get that manure to reduce their own nitrogen synthetic fertilizer application? This is an idea that's just being started but manure is an excellent fertilizer. It also contains a tremendous amount of carbon. So as you put manure into the soil, you can increase your soil organic carbon, increase your water holding capacity, and make these nutrients available for growth. So we need to think more worldwide about how to use manure in the best way that we can, instead of thinking out of it as a waste, water, waste product that, can, um, that doesn't necessarily contribute to agriculture, and, and farmers think they have to augment with synthetic fertilizer. Yeah, I believe that uh, on top of that, one has to think of another issue, which um, uh, perhaps uh, will come up uh, next week or whenever our next uh, um, ecology lecture is. The question is that uh, with the increase in uh, livestock, uh, there is an, there's an issue, especially talking about ruminants, that they produce a lot of methane, which uh, is one of the the greenhouse gases. So, again, we there's no win-win situation in this one. But yes, the, the use of um, of organic uh, fertilizers, organic manure is manure is a uh, is something that uh, has always uh, been used until the 
uh, prevalence of uh, synthetic fertilizers. Here's another question, which is quite interesting. I find it. The, the point is, um, we we perceive ecosystems as as being at the the receiving end, the suffering end of, of nitrogen deposition. Now the question um, that uh, Mateus puts to to you, Jill, is is the following: Is what are the mechanisms that ecosystems um, use to actually somehow balance the the ec extra extra nitrogen, trying to avoid to get to that critical limit? Um, is there is there anything that we can <laughs> think of? Uh, uh, I think uh, it's kind of it reminds me of the concept of the, the ecosystem as an organism. Gaia. Yeah, a self-regulating well. organism. Um, I think they do self-regulate, but it doesn't mean that it benefits the vegetation or the soil microbial communities. Remember, these are ecosystems. There isn't a, a conscious effort to do something. But what, what these ecosystems do is pretty much what I've described all the way through. They leach it out or they volatilize it out. So the way of reducing excess nitrogen is to, um, if you have anaerobic soils, you have N2O production or nitric or, or M2 production. So mineralization is, is a very um, successful way of reducing nitrogen in your soils. Um, leaching is, is the most common way that things happen. Certainly plants take up more nitrogen. Um, algae, some of those that I work with do what's called luxury uptake. They're, they're in a famine mode and they think, oh, here's nitrogen, I'm gonna take it up and store it. And they certainly do this with phosphorus too. So they store up until the, um, as much as they possibly can. And they're, um, it creates bigger, fatter algae. In our case, it's, it's algae that is low in carbon and high in nitrogen. Is that right? No, they produce more carbon. It's a high C to N ratio. So they actually reduce their, so I'm, I'm being unclear. Some algae will take up nitrogen and use that for greater primary productivity. So their carbon to nitrogen ratio increases and nutritionally that decline, that makes for, for less palatable or less nutritious um, food for, for organisms higher in the food web. The same is true for grasses. Um, in the Great Plains, there have been a number of stu studies that as you add nitrogen and as you, as you warm the climate, and the two are now interconnected, you cannot get rid of them. You have greater productivity, but it's higher in carbon and lower in nutrients like nitrogen. So the nutritional value declines for herbivores, such as ruminants that go down. So there is a compensation. It's just not one that we as humans in our anthropomorphic looking necessarily want to see. Soil acidification is another one of those things. It's these ecosystems you could say are compensating for excess nitrogen by leaching out their base cations. The result is bad all around, but the soil gets rid, rid of the nitrogen. Uh, there is an excellent question from Marcelo. Uh, we talked about nitrogen as if nitrogen existed on its own, separated from other elements in, in the uh, complex compound cycles of biogeochemical cycles. So the question is, how do you think interactions of nitrogen with other elements, which also have an influence on the nitrogen cycle, it can be taken uh, for the impact transmitted in the, uh, for the ecosystems? Yeah, no, that is an excellent question. And, and certainly we are, um, we, in the International Nitrogen Management System, INMS, we are criticized all the time for being focused all the time on nitrogen. But that's because we're taking it from a policy standpoint. If you can manage nitrogen, um, and, and there are ways to do that by reducing emissions, for instance, or changing fertilizer applications to crop fields, if we can do that through policy, we can, in, we can help some of these other interactions that you're talking about. So a major um, interaction, of course, is with carbon, and I've mentioned a little bit of that. You cannot you cannot divorce nitrogen from these other effects. Nitrogen affects growth. Car growth is primarily carbon. Nitrogen and phosphorus together are required in order to, to enhance growth. So you cannot only talk about nitrogen without thinking about phosphorus. We don't do that from a policy standpoint because as I just mentioned, we're trying to influence how people think about policy and trying to think 
trying to get policymakers to think more about it, about nitrogen in the same way they think about carbon management. But of course, biogeochemically and ecologically, you, you have to consider not just carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, all the other necessary trace metals, and, and especially water. In, in my part of the world, which is exceptionally dry and getting drier, water is about to become the most limiting element um, molecule, not nitrogen or phosphorus. It's going to be all of these others. And you have to consider them ecologically. Ecosystem models are a great way to do that. Um, for many years, we've, we've worked with, with integrated models that look at the flow of all these elements and their ratios. So the stoichiometry of the, and, which is the proportions of these molecules together, carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus, are, are um, critically important for determining who lives where, how much they uh, can grow, what's their productivity, and what that does to uh, terrestrial and aquatic food systems, or uh, food webs. Great question. Yeah, she has another one in, in store. I'll, I'll, I'll read it out in a minute. Just a quick comment that you, 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 you talked about uh, biogeochemical models. Uh, from the very beginning, the, you can factor in nitrogen deposition to see what it does for the different uh, uh, biological cycles involved in, in principally plant growth. So yes, it cannot be, cannot be divorced. Okay, so the next question from the same Marcelo is, um, do you believe that there are critical physiological limits associated with uh, nitrogen excess and climate uh, imposed uh, limitations. I think you just said the water, but in addition. No, I think there are physiological limits. And I think, and, and so I'll come back to stoichiometry. I think that when you exceed the, the ratios that are acceptable for plant growth, either some other plant that can take up high nitrogen and, and make and, and grow from it will take over. So you will change your your proportions, you will change the evenness of your, of your vegetation mix over time. So the limits I think are, um, I suppose if we're looking at a continuum, the limits are going to be, uh, first you would see some plants take over and, and adapt better to, the, to high concentrations of nitrogen or high temperatures um, than others. Are, are there physical, physical limits? Yes, I'm sure there are. That's a good question. In the absence of water limitation or temperature limitation, I don't know if you could kill everything off by adding so much nitrogen. You can. I suppose you could. So I didn't mention an example and I meant to. Years ago, I did work um, with Bill Bowman, who's at the University of Colorado and colleagues of ours from the Czech Republic. Um, we worked on in the Tatra mountains in Alpine systems. And these are areas that had received high nitrogen and sulfur deposition for decades. So acid rain in a big way. And we then added more nitrogen to them in a series of, of experiments ranging from low nitrogen, which I think was five kilograms per hectare per year up to 30 or 40 kilograms per hectare per year. What we were able to found, find is that over many decades of high nitrogen deposition, the soils had been acidified already before we added our own nitrogen to the point where they had lost all of their base cations and they were being buffered by aluminum. And when we added more nitrogen, we were able to move that buffering down to the next metal that buffers in a biogeochemical sense, which is iron. So we changed the soil pH from, I don't know what it had been initially, to value somewhere around three to four when we started the experiments down to about two and a half by adding nitrogen. So coming back to, is, could you reach a limit? I suppose you could. If you were able to acidify the soils to the point where nothing could grow, it would be like acid mine tailings or something. Okay, uh, let, me, let me go back to your last uh, penultimate slide or the, I think third from the last, which was those various relationships that you you, you described, and in fact, you asked us whether we, we thought that they would be useful for decision makers uh, as indicators of uh, uh, for use in policy. Can I just come back to that and, and say, well, 
I believe that for who would be the policy maker? What kind of policy we are talking about? Because if I'm if I'm thinking, just thinking as a policy maker, I would like to have evidence, evidence before the the damage is is done. Now, okay, in the case of uh, the nitrogen deposition, where it happened for whatever reason historically, um, it has to be somehow. Um, doctored let's put it that way so how can we do that um let me throw the ball back at you what do you think which in which case which which one of those relationships would in your opinion be something that you turning the table and sitting on the other side as a the decision maker a policy maker you would um kind of take as evidence and use it and put it to your um, colleagues in policy making that okay i think this is safe to propose on this basis that we now uh going to pay the farmers to put less nitrogen for example so would it help you i don't think it would i was just going to say i could put that slide back up but i i think so I don't know. I, what I worry is that we have gone down a pointy headed nerdish exercise to try to see if we could. But if I was a policymaker, I would want the science that says there will be a change. And I would like to know when that change would occur. But I don't necessarily need to know. Well, I do. If it's a linear response, and if there is no minimum value where you won't have a harmful effect. You need to know that. And so many human health impacts are like that. They're beginning as studies are done and they're hard to do, I guess, on people. They're finding that there is no minimum level of nitrate in drinking water that doesn't increase the incidence of cancer or, or um, well, I'll stop there, certain types of cancers. So it's, it's a bad thing no matter where, you want to get it all out then it becomes a risk assessment based on, um, on, on how much policymakers are willing to, you know, which populations people are willing to, to uh, throw away. And, and um, unfortunately, I, there's a word for this and I'm not thinking of it, but, but unfortunately policymakers often say, well, we can't get to the level of zero. So we're going to say the very young and the very old who are most vulnerable are, are going to be um, expendable and we would get rid of them. That's, that's what the ultimate effect of, of a policy like that would be. On the other hand, if you had a policy in place where you knew that there was a certain level of buffering that could take place before you start to see an effect, would it affect how you would, what level of, of uh, threshold you would set for policy? You know, what kind of water quality guidance which you put for oligotrophic lakes. I'm actually on a committee right now for the state of Colorado to try to set those guidelines. How little, how much is too much? And it, it has to go with, it, again, it's the critical load. Do you go with the most sensitive ecosystem and say, no, you can't have anything above the background or what kind of trade-off would you have based on, yes, you want a certain quality of life, which means a certain amount of transportation and industry and food productivity. So I, I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm, some of you would have an insight. I'll rephrase it in a different way and perhaps move uh, uh, in a different direction, but stay st still on the same track, more or less. The following, um, if I were to um, suggest, concerned about the as you said various times in your talk, uh, biodiversity loss. Okay, so in the context of uh, nitrogen deposition, we want to reduce nitrogen deposition so that loss can be halted or reversed. Okay, for that, as you said, we need a, a certain uh, a, a threshold defined, quantified, some way or other. So that we can we can uh, put it to the um, policymakers for then decide whether the cost associated with it, whether it's uh, social, uh, economic, etc., is uh, worth doing it. Um, do you have in your uh, scheme 
uh, something that would uh, uh, orient the the decision makers, the policy makers, in this sense. Yes, and there's different ways of doing it. So the critical loads in Europe were decided by consensus of the na of the member nations using the scientific evidence that they had. So they actually have critical loads for nitrogen deposition that and sulfur deposition that are much higher than the values that we have set for the United States. I noticed that. And I think that it's interesting because this is my own personal opinion, but because Europe has been settled for so many thousands of years, what they viewed as baseline conditions were probably already strongly altered by human activity well before they started thinking about um, the effects of pollutants from nitrogen and sulfur. Now, in the United States, our, the, the North America was settled also for, for centuries, but not nearly as heavily um, changed by agriculture until, in, until European settlement. So we claim to have a background value that we could use to say, this is the starting point. This is where you had the most oligotrophic um, system. Whether that's the most diverse, I don't know, but it would have been the most natural. But again, that's an, that's an arrogance of, of Europeans saying, we start before we got here. And that was natural, and then we changed it. So we in the United States are using those values to set the critical loads. One of the things we did in Colorado for the legislation that we now have was we actually lined up a trajectory of change, um, which said if you have nitrogen deposition at the lowest level, you have undisturbed ecosystems. As you increase nitrogen, you start to see changes in sequence from the most sensitive ecosystems to the least. So first you would change lake algae assemblages, then you would change alpine flora, then you would change forest ecosystems, and eventually you'd acidify and have dead fish. And so that was enough to get the policymakers going, oh, we'd like to get back to the very back beginning if we could, and whether they can remains to be seen. But there are many different ways for approaching this for policymakers. Um, one of the things, this is, is somewhat similar to what, and in, in the United States, there are, well, all over the world, there are water quality standards. Those are the ones that are most well established. And, and the drinking water standard is set at 10 milligrams of nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen per liter. What many countries do or states is they say you're either below or above that line. And, and that if you're above that line, they have to take remedial measures, but by then it's too late. If you're below that line, they don't care. And so maybe these functions could be useful in saying, wait a minute, you're approaching a tipping point. And so, or along that trajectory that I was talking about before, maybe you're moving up on that trajectory. So there might be a way there for these functions to be more useful, maybe in working with established policy to say there's gonna be a zone where you need to start con being concerned. I don't know, I did that get at all toward what you asked? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we are we are kind of uh, we're a, we're a bit in the dark. We are seeing the light, but uh, one day we actually I think we'll we'll be able to to define. But it requires a lot of uh, really good quality data, a really good uh, the, the the interpretation. And, and, yes, and you can't ignore. This goes back to a question someone else asked earlier. You can't ignore in this case climate warming yeah. because it exacerbates everything that we do, and and um, it's it's. It, it, talk about um, indirect effects in, in our Rocky Mountain lakes, what we're finding, and in the Rocky Mountains in general, as you warm the climate, you are drying out parts of the Great Basin, which are west of the Rocky Mountains, which is increasing the amount of dust that gets airborne. That dust contains phosphorus. So in addition to high nitrogen deposition, we're now seeing phosphorus deposition and warming Warming is causing longer open water seasons, warmer temperatures, all of these work together um, and, and make it harder to set policy that will actually have an impact. Yeah, basically uh, the, the series of four talks that I put together, uh, this, is, this, this was the idea to, put to, get, to, to bring together climate change, nitrogen deposition, 
and well uh the land use change is, is sort of implicit in all this but then also bring in in the in the last talk that we'll have will be the introduction of of exotic species and how they profit uh, often from a new uh, an, an improved climate an improved uh, nitrogen regime etc etc uh jill would uh let me just say uh, there is one one more question here i think to to finish off um do you think that the impact of high nitrogen in tropical e ecosystem could be even worse considering our soils are are uh, cation and phosphorus pure so that so that basically you uh, the perception of tropical uh, ecosystems forest ecosystems in most of the most part of south america in the neotropics where the, these forests are on old uh, nutrient pure soils mm -hmm. apparently already there is a they are kind of leaking nitrogen if you like so if it if they were affected by atmospheric nitrogen deposition would it make um, a more imbalance the, the the situation having these soils pure in uh, nutrients and in phosphorus so i am no expert on tropical systems i'm embarrassed to say but let's think this through um there is a lot well tell me if this is true is there already a lot of natural biological nitrogen fixation taking place how do these plants already get their nitrogen uh, the, mo the most part of it is pa part of it is is, is is fixation i know that the the, the estimates wi vary widely uh, the most of the nitrogen is sim sim simply the the recycling of, of the litter for we're talking about annually at, at least 100 kilo of nitrogen being uh, recycled from litter for so it's and that makes sense. I think that's true actually in ecosystems everywhere. 95% of the nitrogen is simply recycled. So if that's true, if you add more nitrogen deposition, there's no reason to think you wouldn't see the same kinds of effects we already see in systems that receive a tremendous amount of nitrogen deposition. The excess nitrogen, a little bit of it will go toward enhanced growth, perhaps um, in allowing the dominance of some species. And I didn't even mention the word exotic species, but they often are nitrogen loving and can take them up faster. But ultimately you're gonna leach more out or volatilize more out. And, and if you leach, all of your soils will get more acidic and perhaps more, um, yeah, I don't know what your dominant minerals are, are down there. It's, but, it's basically aluminum and, and iron. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to see an acidification and you're going to see a continued loss of, of acid anions into your surface waters. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, if Jill, you, you don't, perhaps you want to close a uh, closing remark or? I, I do. These were excellent questions. I want to thank you again for inviting me. Um, I would love to visit your sites and your university sometime. So. I also well, extend the welcome for you all to come up to my mountains. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the first opportunity. And you're welcome. And uh, it's an open, open invitation from our side as well. And thank you very much again for accepting the invitation and for this excellent talk. It was very important to, to bring this issue into uh, for, our, for our students. Thank you very oh, much. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.